Hey everybody, it's Brian Asbury, and I just wanted to welcome you to today's episode. If you could, like today's episode, hit that subscribe button, and let's continue to grow the Developmentally Speaking brand. Today my guest is former WWE superstar, trainer, you may remember him as Eugene, but today we're going to get to know Nick Dinsmore. Nick, how are you, sir? I'm doing fantastic, man. I'm down here in Florida. I'm on the beach. Man, it's beautiful down here. Just me and my action figure hanging out. You know, the best part about having your own action figure is you get to play with yourself in public. <laughs> Did you learn that from Rip? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where I heard it. I'm not going to say I made it up, but it's become my joke because I just keep telling it. <laughs> so what made you want to get into professional wrestling? Man, when I was about eight years old, I saw WWF Saturday Night's main event for the first time. I stayed up late on a Saturday night, and I believe it's either the first or the second episode of Saturday Night's main event, but Hogan wrestled Nikolai Volkov, and uh, I think it was the uh, – and then Uncle Elmer got married, and I saw the British Bulldogs. Man, I was just hooked, and, and I fell in love with it. And then I, then I discovered the wrestling magazines at the grocery store. So whenever I would accompany my mother to the grocery store, I would just be – Nose in the magazine section the whole time back when they used to have all those pro wrestling magazines. I just fell in love with it. And that's what I wanted to do. At what point did you decide that this was something you were going to pursue? When I was eight years old, honestly. <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I said, you know, that's what I want to do. And as I got older and older, I just kept thinking about it, kept coming back to it. I was always a pro wrestling fan, WWE, WWF fan, WCW fan. Uh, when I moved to the Louisville, Kentucky area, then I got to see uh, USWA wrestling, so I became a Lawler fan. I used to go to the uh, Louisville Gardens on Tuesday nights. And then uh, when I was in high school, I was a senior, and I was in the homecoming court. I didn't win homecoming king. I think I got cheated, but I didn't win homecoming king. But as they're introducing everybody, this is Nick Tinsmore. He wants to be a WWE, WWF wrestler when he grows up. And a girl I went to school with, she was two grades younger than me, comes up to me. She goes, my dad has a wrestling school in Jeffersonville. And I'm like, it was literally 10 minutes from my house. I didn't know it. And I went, and that was the Nightmare Danny Davis School of Professional Wrestling, which became Ohio Valley Wrestling. And I started wrestling, and I was uh, taught by some great teachers, but I was also in the right place at the right time. <laughs> so how was training with Danny Davis? Because around here, you know, Danny, Jimmy, Rip, that those are mainstays around here. It was, I mean, it was, it was really good. I mean, he, he, he taught me the basics so well. And just everything you need to know to, to have a good foundation and a building block. It wasn't just big moves or high impact moves or what can I do off the top rope. I mean, it was it was you know in football terms it would be blocking and tackling. You know, it'd be bread and butter stuff. And uh, at that time, I had seen Rip Rogers wrestle on the OVW shows, and I I might have met him, but when I first started wrestling for OVW, he was wrestling in Canada for six months, I think. So he finally came back. So I had a little bit a little bit of, uh, six months of experience, not a whole lot. And then I got to start wrestling Rip. And Danny was the one who taught me as a coach from the sidelines, watching videotapes, telling me the moves. But Rip was the one that taught me performing in the ring in front of a live audience. And that's that's really how I learned how, you know, that, that was like another step in the education. You know, that was like, you know, if, if Danny was grade school, then Rip all of a sudden is high school. Mm -hmm. And then when Jim Cornette came aboard and he started writing TV, then he's writing me to be a top guy on TV. So then all of a sudden that's like college, you know. So it was just a, it was it was a great progression, and I was very fortunate to be in the right place. But I worked hard, and you know, it was good. How were those early days in OVW? You know, before it was just Danny was running it, and then Jimmy came in and brought the developmental deal. How was that time period? Because you did a little stuff for WCW back then too, didn't you? Yes, I, I started training in 1996. I signed up with Danny Davis in May of 1996. The WWE deal came, I think late 98 early 99 it might be 99 um and it was uh we first started training in, a, in an old building in jeffersonville uh, the entire building used to be called the quadrangle it was a some kind of complex it was literally like like a square and on one side was watch street and that's where i first started the training but soon after we moved onto the other side of the building which was mechanic street and if anybody sees the videos where the big obw poles in the middle of the screen that, that's the mechanic street building and I loved the training, but it was hot. I mean, we had no air conditioning. And, like, when we did TV in there, they had all the TV lights. And it was like a tin roof or something, man. It got so hot. But when we first started training, it was just all guys from around, you know, 
Southern Indiana, Kentucky area, just just regular dudes. And then when the WWE developmental guys came, then all of a sudden all these you know specimens and athletes started coming in, you know, like like John Cena and Batista and Randy Orton and Brock Lesnar. And then you know, you know some of the some of the other guys that were local to uh, uh, the Kentucky and Louisville, Kentucky area, you know they they kind of didn't get weeded out, but they didn't get as much time. And I think they kind of, you know, found other places to, to work, but I was fortunate enough to have enough experience that I got to help train those guys. Mm-hmm. And then I had the ability to actually make it to TV also. So how long into when WWE came aboard, did your developmental deal come about? So you said I wrestled for WCW. So in 1997, I got to wrestle for USWA in their last couple of weeks before they shut down. Mm-hmm. I did the Brian Pillman Memorial Show, I think, in early 98, and that's where I met Terry Taylor. He was the agent for WCW at the time. He started calling me into WCW. I did, I think, uh, two Nitros and three Thunders and a handful of Saturday nights. I didn't realize at the time Terry Taylor got released from WCW, but then he was hired by WWE. So December of 1999, I was given a a developmental contract with WWE. So uh, Flash Flanagan and I were like the first two guys from OVW, you know, OBW wrestlers, as opposed to the developmental talent coming in that were given contracts. So when you went into developmental, how was the the first or the early years in doing it? Because, you know, you mentioned Cena, Batista and them, but developmental for me was yourself, Conway, the Bashams, Brent Albright, Skyfire. That's what developmental, that's what I fell in love with. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, we started on the, the Mechanic Street building when Cornette first came in and started doing the matchmaking and the creative direction. And uh, at that time, we were transitioning to the, the, the Louisville building, which is what OVW housed, uh, you know, later and now also. So Danny was doing a lot of that, and I got to do a lot of the training myself with all those guys. So, again, the building was hot, and these guys were working hard. I mean, these were, these were prime athletes. But the, the TV was centered around – like you said, myself, Rob Conway, Doug Basham, the damage of Danny Basham, and Quint would work all the developmental guys in to work with us. And, you know, normally we, we were the ones that had, you know, the best spots because we had the most experience and, and, and the crowd was really reacting to us. And also the developmental guys might not be there very long time. They might get called up, which a lot of them did. But it, it was exciting. I mean, it was, you know, I, I, I had a great job. I was doing pro wrestling for a living living in you know sleeping in my own bed every night you know the the, the part of the show was maybe two hours away mm-hmm. you know i was on tv locally I, I became a star in louisville so was there any early plans on for yourself as developmental came about i honestly don't think that we were considered because we were all paid substantially less than the developmental talent they were bringing in we were making like a fifth of what those guys were making weekly but at the time, I mean, I wanted to make it to the main roster of WWE, but I didn't, I didn't know that that, that was actually going to happen. So I was really content where I was. You know, I had a good job. Um, but then as time went on, a lot of us just kept getting better and kept getting better, and we became so good that, you know, that they couldn't deny us. Mm-hmm. There was one, there was one I, a, a sparkle of an idea when uh, John Cena was the, uh, uh, the, the first heel character, not his first one, but the, the, the rapper Chains. Mm-hmm. They wanted Rob Conway and I to come out with him. I was going to have a football and Rob was going to have a basketball. And I had no idea what that meant or where that would go. But that was like an idea. And it might have worked just because Cena would have gotten us, us over. But I'm, I'm kind of glad that we, we took the direction we took. <laughs> so was developmental like that back then? It was just, hey, we're going to try this. We're going to try that. Just throw shit against the wall, see what sticks. If it doesn't work, we're going to move on. Because I feel uh, like – go ahead. No, you know, so sometimes absolutely, but it was still it was still in the infancy. Mm-hmm. And OVW was an indie company that contracted with WWE, as opposed to WWE's Performance Center now, which is another layer of that. WWE, you know, does excellent work on everything, and, and that's what that that's what the Performance Center is. But a lot of times, yeah, I mean, most guys had a character. Sometimes Cornette would give them a little bit of direction, and we just kind of see what what came out. I've seen where he also didn't agree with a lot of the time that they would give a character change as well. No, I think it was more like they would call the day of TV and go, Jimmy, I need this guy on TV. He needs to do this character. And Jimmy was writing the TV six and eight weeks out. Mm-hmm. He's like, I can't put him on yet. You know, I can put him on in six weeks. And it was kind of a, a conflict. But again, 
it was an indie company. It was Danny's and Jimmy's company, and WWE was contracting with them. And I think that was maybe some of the conflicts that made them eventually, you know, branch out into, into developing their, their own talent. Is there any moments from OVW that, that stand out more than others? You've had so many. Before it was developmental, we ran the Louisville Gardens, and it was a it was it was a free show. And I didn't know how many people would show up. And man, we, we nearly sold the place out. And three, four thousand people showed up for a free show. And it was awesome. And that's kind of where we started the momentum for TV and building, you know, building the product. And then when we, we started doing the bigger shows, like the uh, uh, the Christmas Chaos, when you know, Steve Austin comes in, when The Undertaker comes in, I mean, when we outdrew WCW that came to the same building in the same month. And, and, and that was just phenomenal, you know. Mm-hmm. During your reign as OVW champion, any particular matches stand out more than others? I think maybe like, what, I don't know if it was the first or the second time I won the title, but I wrestled Rip. And uh, like in my head, we were all 19 to 20-ish year old guys, you know, young guys. And Rip was like a 42-year-old bodybuilding man, you know, mm-hmm. professional wrestler. and we would do the stuff we trained in practice. We would, you know, run the matches that we did in practice, but Rip was completely different. And the people believed Rip. And he, mm-hmm. he Oh, your sound cut out just at the tail end there. Uh, where ask the question again so I, yeah i was asking if there was any specific match during your time as ovw champion that stood out more than others so i don't know if it was the first or the second time i won the heavyweight title but i, I believe it might have been the first i won it from rip rogers i think it was the second one but at that point the crowd has started to grow so more people saw me win win the second title but like I was saying, Rip, you know, people believed Rip. We were all young kids, I felt like, 19 to 20-year-old guys. And uh, Rip was just a, a bodybuilding man that looked like he beat the heck out of us. Very believable. And when I beat him, the crowd went crazy. And then, like I said, you know, when the real deal Rod Steele came in, the legendary real deal Rod Steele, God rest his soul, we blew the roof off the Davis Arena. <laughs> I remember going to the OVW shows, and that crowd was just so hot and so electric every Wednesday night that was just it was it made you love wrestling even more that building was so special to a lot of people the uh, the old Davis Arena in Jeffersonville is, is really the, the the building that I like the best because it was small it was intimate I mean if we filled up all the seats and, and packed people in their standing room only it might have held maybe 200 people mm-hmm. but then we moved yeah. to the bigger arena in Louisville and that would hold like 400 450 people but the old arena, I don't know something about it. It was just, you know, also that's kind of where I started, where I had my first match. So it was very sentimental to me. <laughs> now, as it came time to go to the main roster, what other kind of ideas were you thrown out or were they thrown to you to pitch you to go on TV? Well, I mean, like I said, the developmental system was different back then. Cornette would kind of give us direction, but the office never really, sometimes they give, at least us, the mm-hmm. developmental talent that, that the WWE brought down, they might have given them a bit more direction, but there really wasn't a whole lot of direction. So I was doing dark matches and extra work, and I was just wrestling as Nick Dinsmore. And I remember one time uh, Jim Ross came up to me, and he's like, you know, you, you're a good wrestler, but you're, you're kind of like Dean Malenko. You, you got, got no got no facials, got no you know personality. So that's when I decided, you know, I'll just turn it up as far as I can turn it up and make the faces bigger than I should and overplay it. And it was Rip, you know, Rip's, Rip, Rip's son genius of a kid but he has autism and rip's idea came to me maybe 2003 late 2003 so what about an idea for a wrestler that maybe he's not very social maybe he can't tie his shoes you know maybe he can't put the square peg in the square hole but he can do anything on wrestling that he's ever seen because he's watched it his whole life and then there was an extra layer to to, to the character that i thought of, like well eugene would know all the uh, all the trivia you know, mm-hmm. there's a wrestling match in some foreign country somewhere, and this was the attendance, and he knew every little minute detail. So I, I put that idea that Rip gave me in the back of my head and kind of milled it around. 
a couple months go by, and the agents would come down once a month. Guys like Arn Anderson and Dean Malenko, Fit Finley. And I pitched. I remember I told Arn, I said, Arn, what about this character? Just like I explained. And he's like, we, we, we're we more reality-based now. We, we don't do gimmicks like that anymore. Said, okay. So I just went about my business. A couple months later, the writers came down. The writers rarely came down to Louisville. But they came down. I pitched it to the writers. Vince would never do anything like that. Vince wouldn't do a character like that. Okay, whatever. So I'd seen a lot of guys, a lot of developmental guys complain about being in OBW, and all of a sudden they get called up to TV. The squeaky wheel gets the oil, right? So mm -hmm. I told Doug Basham, I said, Doug, I think I'm going to try to quit and go to Japan. I had no intention of quitting. I didn't know anybody in Japan. I don't, I don't know how I would have gotten there. But Doug told Dean Malenko. Dean tells Johnny Ace. Next thing I know, uh, February of 2004, I'm sitting in a meeting with Vince McMahon. Stephanie McMahon's there. Vince goes, I want to get back to character-based wrestling. And I just pitched out that character right there. And he's mulling it over. <laughs> the Rain Man of Wrestling. Steve Austin was there doing a, a Saturday Night's Main event taping. Austin walks in and Vince goes, Steve, you ever seen this guy wrestle? And he goes, no, I don't think so. I said, well, Nightmare Danny Davis trained me because I knew that Danny and uh, uh, Steve Austin had become friends when they were in Dallas. And Austin looks at me and he goes, well, you're probably one of the best. And it was like that vote of confidence. And Vince goes, great, we'll start on Monday. We didn't actually start the following Monday, but the character started to develop there. Now in the developmental system, they would do character studies and, and give you your, uh, uh, you know, every little aspect of what your character should be. Back then, it was just like I went to the ring and just it just came out of me. It was just like this energy that came out. You know, I, I knew that I wanted to be a comedy kids character because Hurricane was the only kids character. Hurricane and Rosie, but I think at the time they might have been a Raw, but there was two brands. You know, mm -hmm. Raw and SmackDown were separate. So I knew that one TV show didn't have a comedy kids character. And this was, this was after Austin's big run, after the NWO, but everybody still wanted to be a cool, strong heel that got all their moves in. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be complete opposite. I wanted to sell and be, be a baby face and just have fun out there. And it just really, I, I, I took stuff from like Handsome Jimmy Valiant or Junkyard Dog or just all the legends that I liked. And it just started, to, it, it just started you know, building on its own. It just it came out and it, it, became, it became great. It was a magical time. How was it being in developmental so long and then you finally get on that main roster? You had to be beyond ready to show them what you could do. As Rip would say, you have to be overprepared. <laughs> and, and, and that was one benefit I had. A lot of people were like, I can't believe you were, were down there for so long in developmental. But I didn't see it that way because, again, mm -hmm. I didn't know if I would ever really make it to the main roster. So I was mm -hmm. really happy where I was. But when I made it to the main roster, I had eight years of experience. Mm -hmm. And I, I always say that I was a, I was a 10 year overnight success, but when WWE you know had me do something, I did well. So then they had me do a little more, and I did well. And I knew how to, I knew how to play the crowd. And again, that was that was Rip Rogers teaching me how to be a performer in the ring, and I just did it in a WWE ring, and the fans went nuts. Mm -hmm. I think my fifth episode of Raw was was the episode I had with The Rock. I don't know of any other superstar that has skyrocketed to popularity that quick. Mm -hmm. Signs everywhere. I mean, it was. It, it, it was a lot, but it was everything I ever dreamed of. Got the action figure, got the T-shirt, you know. Mm -hmm. And they did. They put you with The Rock, Triple H, Hulk, like you were with everybody. So what was that like working with all the like it, like you said, this overnight? It you were there, and here it is. This and everybody loved it. That's got. Was that intimidating at all? You just straight here. Uh, no, it wasn't so much intimidating because by the time I got there, all the other locker room were guys that I helped train in OVW. Mm -hmm. So I, I'd met some of the legends, but when I got to work with them, I mean, it was and, – and because Eugene was so popular, the legends loved to work with the popular guy. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just uh, – I mean, again, it was, it was a, a – guy... I had my WrestleMania moment with Hulk Hogan. You know, I was in the ring with The Rock. I pinned Vince McMahon. I won the tag team titles. I mean, really, I mean, it was a dream come true. But it was like a – it's like you it's like you jump on a fast train because like all the outside world you just because you're on the road five six days a week sometimes weeks at a time and you're just you're just training eating wrestling training flying training driving and uh you know it just, you just take off and then you look back and go wow that was that was like five years of my life that just went, went like that but it was it was awesome yeah and you were on tv that whole time now developmental for me that that time period i felt bad for a lot of guys looking back on it because it was like you would see somebody from ovw go to tv gone the next week okay let's bring up the next guy fired bring up the next guy 
I, I just I guess I didn't really was their focus just not on it at that time you feel or they just needed to churn out the right character like right then and there you know I, I feel like those guys weren't, weren't given enough time to develop because mm -hmm. when I was a coach at the performance center that they, they said that, that they're willing to invest like I think four to six years in developing somebody and that's probably about the right amount of time that it takes but some of those guys had a little bit of experience came to Louisville for a little bit and then got called straight up and they didn't pan out because they didn't have the experience. Mm -hmm. And that, that was kind of unfortunate for them, but, you know, I guess that's the way it goes. Is there any moments that, you know, you said you were in the ring with Hogan, with The Rock. Was there anything that you wanted to do that you didn't get to do or you were supposed to do? Other than when I was paired with William Regal, eventually there was going to be a turn. Mm -hmm. It would probably be Regal turning on Eugene. And that was talked about and discussed. We'll do it down the line. But then I got injured and he got drafted to SmackDown. And, and that was the end of Eugene and Regal's run. Mm -hmm. But I mean, when they put us together, I never had like that type of chemistry with somebody. It was awesome that I was Bischoff's nephew because that gave me instant credibility. Plus, Bischoff was almost not in every segment on Raw, but general manager, he was in a lot. Mm -hmm. And they paired me with William Regal, who's just coming back, who's, you know, notoriously phenomenal. And uh, I, I got to be paired with him. And he helped me out a lot, too. He would be doing something. He was the one run around with your arms out like you're an airplane. So Eugene would do that. And he'd be pulling me back. He'd go, all right, now, now do a roll forward and take off. And he'd take off. And uh, Regal and Fit were the ones that had Eugene take out the teddy bear. And the bad guys would rip it up. And Eugene would cry. I mean, it was I mean, it was awesome. I mean, and, and, I, and I got to ride with, with Regal. The, the car was William Regal and Tajiri and myself. And so it was, it was it was like Barnum and Bailey Circus on Wheels. <laughs> when when your release came about, did they give you a reason why? Or what would your next move be then? So I got released for being non-compliant to the uh, uh, wellness policy. Mm -hmm. Although I failed one wellness uh, policy, and back then it was supposed to be three. But I don't know. It was probably the, the best thing for me at the time. But after that, uh, I didn't know what I was going to do. But then the phone started ringing for indie shows non-stop and i started working almost as much as i did with wwe on the indie shows and uh it was so much less stress mm -hmm. and like on wwe when we were in the states we'd have to pay for our hotel and a rental car but on the indies the the promoters cover all that so it really it really you know was kind of nice mm -hmm. and then i had a comeback to wwe for one match in 2009 before i got beat by the miz um then i was back on the indies until i started as a coach in 2013. How did your coaching job come about? I was told that I was on a short list of guys they wanted to hire and uh, the short list of one person, which was me. And they were transferring from FCW in Tampa to the Performance Center in Orlando and they wanted to build a, a, a big coaching staff. And uh, they brought me down there and brought me in. Um, it, it was an awesome opportunity. I mean, I learned so much there because there's so much knowledge there and all those coaches and just the stuff they did, it was, it was phenomenal. Um, but my, my time there came to an end in 2015, which I, I was ready for that because I knew I wanted to start my own wrestling company, which mm -hmm. I did in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. My wife and I moved to Sioux Falls. That's where she's from. And we started a wrestling company there. I sold it in 2021, and now I'm living in Florida. But good things have been happening. Good things are still coming. So how was it, you know, you went through OVW. You've seen developmental then. And then you get brought in as a coach, and you see what developmental is now. Was it like a culture shock as to, you know, is it easier or for talent today than it was then? I'm going to say it's not easier for the talent today. I don't know that I could have gotten through what these guys go through now. But as a coach, it wasn't necessarily a culture shock. I had so much more experience by the time I was a WWE coach that I could teach these guys so much better and really break down like little minuscule nitpicking things and say you should do it this way because this and then – I see the light bulb come on. Oh, I get it now. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, Adam Rose. I, I was working with him one day, and I was telling him something, and it was like so so, so easily understandable because he goes, I've been here for four years, and nobody's ever told me that. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So I, I love being a coach because I loved all the all the students that I had there. Um, but, man, those, those guys are expected to work hard. They, they work out in their gym every day. They do hours of training. They do the shows. I mean, it's, it's difficult. Is there any talents you enjoyed working with or helped develop during your time there, like Adam? 
Braun Strowman was in my class when, when he first started there. And then uh, uh, Chad Gable was also. But then there were certain days, like my class, I generally got the people that were brand new. And some of them had no experience. Some of them had a little experience. And, and we would just, again, start on the very basics. Get in the ring. Learn how to hit the ropes. Learn how to, you know, hit the turnbuckles. And uh, But sometimes I would have classes where anybody could come. And that's when I got to work with, like, Charlotte and Sasha Banks and, you know, Adam Rose came to that one. Some, some of the more uh, uh, experienced talent. Mm -hmm. So you said, you know, your time came to an end and then you opened your school. How was that? I mean, because I followed it and it seemed like you were staying busy with opening that school and you did some shows and stuff. So how was that? You've always been a trainer, it seems like, just like you have been a wrestler. Yeah, I, I feel like I've, if maybe I wasn't a wrestler, I might have been a teacher or something because I just had the knack to be able to easily explain certain details of a subject to people. And I love running my own company, but it began to wear on me after about seven years. It got to be pretty, because I mean, I was I was teaching the guys in the, in, in the classes, I was booking shows, I was running the shows, and then I was doing all the, the YouTube videos, all the graphics, all the editing. I had to teach myself how to edit, and I, I wasn't good, I'm still not great, but I was doing it, you know, because I, I, I like Danny Davis was always on a shoestring budget. He wasn't going to spend more than he had to, and that's what I learned from. So that's what I did. I, I wanted to, you know, put out the bare minimum and try to make as much as we could. Uh, the only downside that I didn't foresee was South Dakota doesn't have a large population. <laughs> Sioux Falls only has 180,000 people. So if I would have opened a school like in some bigger city, Houston or Phoenix or, or even Tampa, you know, I probably could have drawn more people and more students. But I brought professional wrestling. My wife and I brought professional wrestling to Sioux Falls. She was like, there's no independent wrestling in Sioux Falls. I'm like, there's got to be up there somewhere. But there wasn't. And it was like the closest uh, pro wrestling show was was three hours south in, in Omaha. So when I first so when I first ran my first show, I didn't have any wrestlers. So I, I went down and wrestled for the guys in Omaha, and then I asked a, a crew of them to come up and wrestle for me. And from the, the the first show that I had, I got two students. So we worked for two months, and then the first two students wrestled on the second show. And I don't know if you remember like the old WWE Desire videos with the uh, the Creed song. I ripped that off completely, and, and I had. To, I, I had those two guys talking like it was their first match and it showed them training and jumping jacks and getting ready. And by the time they walked out, the crowd was going crazy for them. Never seen them before. And from that, I got six students. So then I had eight and it just started to build and progress. And it was, it was really fun, but I feel like if I would have had a uh, more people I could delegate and rely on to do certain aspects, it, it would have taken stress off me, but I wasn't there yet. So, how has life been after you sold that? You've got a YouTube channel. You're still traveling all over the place. You're in Florida now. Well, like the COVID hit, which really hurt the the, the live the live events and, and the training. And then I ended up selling the company to some of the students that I had. Um, my mom lives down here in, in, in Florida, so I came down here to be with her. She's getting a little bit older. Um, but again, I'm, I'm starting to branch out and do more indie shows. I've got one coming up in Florida. I'm going to England next month. But uh, a new project, like you said, is a YouTube channel called Eugene Behind the Scenes from the Von Lila Studios. And I'm going to talk in depth, you know, just like we're talking about, about my career and things that I've done. But we're going to go a little bit more into the weeds on, on the YouTube channel. And, you know, I'm, I don't want to talk bad about anybody or, or let anybody's secrets out. But the, the stories I saw, I'm going to talk about on there. Mm -hmm. You know, it seems like it, all these YouTube channels are now becoming more popular and a lot of people really want to hear, you know, about your career and about certain moments and stuff. So, you know, thank you for what you've done for professional wrestling, what you continue to do. You know, I knew you from Nick Dinsmore to Eugene when you were Mr. Wrestling, just everything. And I greatly appreciate everything that you've done for professional wrestling. And it's meant a lot. Oh, man, it was, it was like, I mean, it was my dream come true. You know, it was, it was like I, I, I was... I was the lucky one. I was the kid in the candy store that, that went after his boyhood dream and made it, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know many people that can say that, but I'm, I'm really glad that my mother brought me up, sent me to a private school, you know, really gave me a good education and, and a good work ethic and all the coaches I had and just, just kept progressing. Danny Davis trained me, Rip helped me, Cornette helped me, Terry Taylor helped me. So I had a lot of people that, that liked me. Is there anything that you haven't got to do yet? Win the world title. Never say never, brother. Never say never. 
I'm, 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 da- I'm down here in Florida and I'm helping coach uh, a school here called uh, Fight the World Wrestling. And the owner of that wrestles for the NWA. So I was at an NWA show recently. And I saw that NWA title, never say never. You know, I just want one title shot. That's all I need. <laughs> Where can people reach out to you at? I'm on my Twitter at the letter U G E N E Dinsmore D I N S M O R E. I do have an Instagram, which is Nick Dinsmore, but I I, I don't go on. I, I felt like when Instagram came out, I was already a little bit older than the young crowd, and I know the young crowd likes it. And I, I'll look at it every now and then, but I like the Twitter, um, and then I have another YouTube channel that has a lot of my older matches and interviews and stuff, and that is the Nick Dinsmore YouTube channel. But the project we're doing now is Eugene Behind the Scenes, so please subscribe to both of them. I think, I think we got like six or seven thousand subscribers in the first week and a half or two weeks that's good that's really good shot right up but von (laughs) lawis is awesome he's also uh helps rip rogers on 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 his youtube show podcast whatever we call it von lawis has become the editor that i needed when i had my wrestling company (laughs) is if there's any advice you can give to anybody getting into professional wrestling what would it be don't burn your boots and get the f out (laughs) no i mean my mother told me that, you know, you don't want to live your life being a wish I had. So I wanted to be a professional wrestler, but she also told me I had to go to college. So I got a degree from Indiana. I've, I've not really used it, but I have a degree from Indiana. So I would suggest everyone, you know, get a degree, learn a trade, something, because wrestling's not going to last forever. Your body's not going to hold up forever. And you have to be able to transition it into something else. Not a lot of people can make a career with professional wrestling, especially if they're not with WWE. Mm-hmm. So get trained by a good trainer. Learn your basics. Don't do anything silly, you know. And uh, as Rip used to say, save your money. It's not how much you make; it's how much you save. <laughs> well, I just want to say thank you for coming on today. It's been an honor. And if there's anything I can ever do for you, please feel free to reach out. I appreciate it, man. I want to say hi to all my fans and thank you for having me on on your interview. Thank you, sir. <laughs>